This is a Chronicle podcast, bringing you ideas in the service of medicine. From the Chronicle podcast system, this is the NPC podcast of the National Pharmaceutical Congress for November 2, 2022. The NPC podcast is where we discuss and consider the purpose, process and people of the pharma industry, and today, we'll continue the healthcare conversation. This program is presented in cooperation with Imprez, Canada's next generation commercial partner. The industry is rapidly evolving, and Imprez is designed to help you evolve with it. Learn more about Imprez tailored best-in-class solutions at www.imprez.com. Our guest today is life sciences consultant Mark Smithies. Mark will join your hosts, Jim, Mark, and Mitch. And to start today's conversation, here's Mitch Shannon, CEO of Chronicle Companies. Welcome back to the NPC podcast from the National Pharmaceutical Congress. This is our special post-Halloween edition, and I'm your co-host Mitch Shannon coming to you from our haunted podcast gondola, where the ghosts of some familiar figures in life sciences sometimes appear. With me in this altogether spooky place is Mr. James Shea, General Manager at the Council for Continuing Pharmaceutical Education in Montreal. Jim, isn't it time you took off your Halloween costume and and started to get ready for the National Pharma Congress? It's taking place today, Wednesday, November 2nd. Well, I'll tell you what. I went dressed as a pre-COVID businessman. It shocked the heck out of my wife, and I've been dressing up for my basement ever since. You know, gets me focused for the day, so I'm going to stick with it. Yeah, it's a good look. The man who needs no introduction and certainly no longer requires a costume is Mark McElwain, the esteemed pharmaceutical industry consultant and healthcare maven. Mark, perhaps for next Halloween 2023, we can all coordinate our outfits. You can wear a Jim Shea mask and I'll come dressed as McElwain. And what do you think about that? That's too scary for me, but more to the point, too scary for the neighbor's kids. These days, they probably insist on a scary content warning. That is so true. So true. So I am scary content. You got to gotta admit. <laughs> All right. Tricks and treats aside, we are your podcast hosts, known simply as Jim, Mark, and Mitch, because all the creative brand names were already taken, such as the Ghostly Trio or Halloween Part 376. So boys and ghouls, let's welcome the president of Life Sciences Consulting of Toronto, Mark Smithies. Hi, Mark. Good day. Glad to be with you guys. I just want to add that You know, I paid a lot of money for this Spider-Man costume, so I will be wearing it today at at the Congress. Impressive abs, I'll give you that. Well, thank you. It's amazing what a little plastic molding will do. Exactly. So in that we now have two Marks in the conversation, we'll need to differentiate between Mark the guest and Mark the co-host. So Mark my words. Yeah, yeah, it it happened. So Mr. Smithies, as mentioned, you are the president of the uh, Life Sciences Consulting Group. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about your company and its vision? I sure can. We've actually rebranded Janus Life Sciences Consulting. The original name Life Sciences Consulting was made up in a fit of lack of creativity. So we've decided to put a little bit more creativity into it. So now it's Janus Life Sciences Consulting. The vision for us has really come about in that there are three things that just about every early stage company and startup company need. That's where we're focused, early stage and startup companies in life sciences. And they all need three things from my experience. They need funding, money, they need strategy, and they need commercialization plans. The vast majority of these companies are founded by brilliant people with extraordinary ideas, and it might be a therapeutic or a medical device, OTC, diagnostics, all of these things, some just brilliant technology, but they don't have the business skills. And that's where I plug in. I'm the business guy. I have the MBA. I plug into their innovation and work to find them the the money so that they can commercialize. And as I say, the strategy and the commercialization plans. It's Mark here, the other one. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic we're emerging from. So Mark, how would you say your consulting company fared during COVID? It fared very well, actually. I, you know, and I've sort of been reflecting on this as perhaps many people have, you know, have we done better or worse with COVID? And I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer. There were some huge advantages with the way things were in that, you know, if you were making 
cold calls on people. There, there seemed to me to be a greater willingness to have a meeting. Certainly, we are all much more efficient in some ways. And so there, there just seemed to be an openness to uh, meeting and, and having discussions. There is no question that in-person meetings and in-person networking are far superior, but we didn't seem to be challenged in building our business. Certainly, the pace of innovation in life sciences did not change, did not slow. So that core group that I've described, the innovators in life sciences, they all continue to need money and commercialization plans and, and strategy. Well, that's good. And in a related question, I guess, in your opinion, what changes did the pandemic require that were for the better and are likely here to stay? I think one of the big things, the obvious things is the use of Zoom. It's interesting because when I had my startup many years ago, I came across Zoom and introduced it to the team because we had a field force and people were very reluctant to engage on camera. And so it worked, but I knew it could work better. And the pandemic certainly jump-started that. So, you know, I think that virtual meeting can be so valuable. I think that it is going to continue to be a central part of, of how we do business. The balance is going to be how much we rely on it. Because I, I, mean, I can tell you, I've been to a number of events in the last couple of weeks, got a couple more this week. There's no substitute for in-person meetings. They are incredibly valuable from a networking perspective, from an idea generation perspective. So I'm very happy with the virtual, but it's got to be a tool that we use. It's not everything that we can rely upon. That's interesting. It's Jim here. Yeah, I, I've had a WebEx license, I think, for 13 years. So really, there wasn't too much of a change. And that was always for delivering our webinars to students. Jim, it never failed to have a problem when we were doing a webinar. The technology just wasn't there. And I always was nervous and frankly, very hesitant to engage in that technology because of the problems. Those have gone away. I mean, it ooh, that is silk now. So from that perspective, I think we've made a huge leap forward. But those early days of webinars, some of them were painful. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're great now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's it. We used to get the video and then we'd all call in on our phones, right? <laughs> you said you're the businessman, so you have your MBA. But I find something interesting there. You've also got a bachelor's degree in political science, which helps. And history. So, so really, that's a, a little bit of a different mix-up for pharma, that's for sure. So how has that educational history ha -ha, affected your career path? Yeah, political science and, and history. What the hell am I doing in a high science area like pharmaceuticals and medical devices? It has helped tremendously. You know, I didn't know it at the time. I took politics and, and history not for a career. It was because I was passionate about it and I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. But as it turns out, it is actually a very valuable degree and set the foundation for me with respect to communications, communicating ideas, developing a, a reasoned argument, all of those things which are essential to sales, to marketing, to market access, to you know finding clients, to pitching startups, to venture capitalists and angels. So as it turned out, it was actually a very important skill set that I got from the undergraduate. Now, the, the MBA certainly, was it more significant? I don't know. It's interesting. I haven't really thought about whether it was more significant or less significant. It certainly has been incredibly valuable for me. It was an executive MBA that I took. So it was much later in my career, Kellogg Dulek, and just a great, great program. And I learned so much in that program. Interesting, the biggest thing I learned actually was to categorize things that I had been doing for years. So, you know, I'd be in the middle of a course and they, you know, the professor would have some name for something and I, you know, a light bulb would go off and say, oh, that's what they call it. And oh, that's why I do that. It was reaffirming in many ways of my career and things that I did with respect to leadership or marketing or, or whatever it was. And then the other big thing with the MBA was that it really disintegrated any of the, the self-limitations that I had on, on myself. And I didn't even know they were there until I was in the program and, and those started to disappear. So yeah, it was a, an extremely valuable. And, and the network has been fantastic as well. Good answer. Wow. Yeah. Continuing on with a 
on the educational side, you're also a sessional lecturer teaching medical device reimbursement. There, there aren't too many people on that side, for sure. In the Master of Biotechnology program, the Institute for Management and Innovation at the University of Toronto. Now, how do you manage, and this is the tough one, how do you manage two very different worlds, the academia and industry? That's a good question. I don't really have to manage the world of academia, to be honest. I'm not sure how much I'm actually exposed to it, because the situation is this. I'm a sessional lecturer, so I built a course around medical device reimbursement, and I bring to them the business perspective. So, you know, I walk into the University of Toronto, you know, I set up, I lecture to these very intelligent young people, humbly (laughs) intelligent young people, and they are enthusiastic, they're engaged. And so I share my business perspective on reimbursement specifically, but reimbursement isn't, you can't understand reimbursement unless you understand the broader context. So the course actually has a quite a bit of broad context to help students. And so I go in and I lecture and I share my knowledge and I leave, you know, mark papers and so on. So I don't really sense that I have a tremendous exposure to academia itself. But, you know, perhaps I do, and I'm just, I just adapt to it while I, you know, that's all I can say. Well, the way you're answering that question, you seem to be enjoying it. How's it going that way, personally? Absolutely loving it. You know, it really is inspiring to teach these people at the beginning of their careers. It's not the first time I've done this. Like, I've done a lot of mentoring over the years, so I, I do enjoy that, you know, sharing my knowledge and helping people and guiding people and seeing what they can do. So it's certainly not out of character for me. Very cool. We need more people like you. We're listening to Mark Smithies, the life sciences consultant on the NPC podcast. So Mark, I know you also do some volunteer work for nonprofits, which is something else that we admire about you. Why don't you tell us a bit about that? Well, thank you. Again, this is another aspect of giving back. I've been on a few charity boards. Endeavor really stuck out for me, Endeavor for not for profits, because it's that concept of give a man a fish and you feed him for a day teach them how to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. So this organization will go into charities and consult with them and advise them on whatever their issues are. It may be strategy, it may be structure, whatever it is, we'll consult and provide recommendations and so on. And in doing so, we elevate their efficiency, their ability to do their work And it's incredibly gratifying. And the quality of work I have been so impressed with, and I don't take any credit on that, the volunteers that work with Endeavor are not dissimilar to the the folks I described in the classroom. You know, they tend to be younger, they're earlier in their careers, they're incredibly enthusiastic, they're looking to give back. And I think this is something that's really positive about this next generation that we're seeing. And they're also looking for opportunities to develop their career. And and that's one of the nice things about this charity is that it gives people an opportunity. It's a development opportunity. It's not just, you know, I'm going out and and picking up garbage and that kind of thing, or, you know, working at a food bank, all of that is, we need people to do that. And that's, and that's admirable. I I think the bonus with, with the volunteers at Endeavor is that they get that opportunity to actually have an impact on their career and develop their skills. So it's a, it ends up being, you know, to use an overused expression, it's a win, win, win. Well, it's Jim here. Now, in all that extra time in your life, obviously, that you have, uh, you're also the chair of uh, Life Science Ontario's board of directors. Can you tell us a little bit about that role? Yeah, that's been incredibly gratifying. The Life Sciences Ontario has in the last decade, I've been board chair, I guess I'm coming up on my sixth year and I'll be stepping down from that this year, but uh, been on the board for at least a decade as well. And so I have seen this organization go from a fledgling, almost like a fledgling startup to now where we are completely 100% member funded. We have a staff of four or five, I think uh, we're up to now. And we're doing some incredibly good work. I think we're we're now recognized as a thought leader. Certainly during COVID, we saw that we were one of the, the organizations that government came to to talk about how to get things done and to help them with contacts. I don't think it's any surprise that we've seen from the current provincial government a, a commitment to 
build a life sciences strategy. That's something we've been asking for for a decade. Not one built by government, but with government, with academia, with industry together to create a, a life sciences strategy. And, and that's kind of an essential, well, for any any business guy, that's kind of step number one. So we're, we're maybe a little bit behind on that. But the point is that the Life Sciences Ontario has grown to be this credible voice with government. And we've found a model where we are self-sustaining and through the incredible generosity of our members. And so we continue to provide value in every way we can for those members. But it's a tremendous organization. Yeah, it's a success story for sure. Uh, CCP is is a member organization, actually. So well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Advancing technology. We already talked about the advancements within WebEx, you know, uh, <laughs> and the use of Zoom and all of these things. But that's just scratching the surface. So, you know, advancing technology is shaking up industry, shaking up business, shaking up everything. So let's just call it how has high tech actually presented itself in your specific field right now? Mm -hmm. Well, it's of course central to what I do because I am dealing with the cutting edge technology and innovation and taking that cutting edge innovation and technology to venture capitalists and angels and finding funding and trying to build companies out of that. So that is absolutely central. I think, which is the easy answer to your question. I think if you look a little bit deeper and maybe a little bit into the future, I know AI has become a bit of a buzzword. And the challenge with artificial intelligence is it can mean just about anything, which is part of it being a buzzword, right? It, it can be a, an if and statement in an Excel spreadsheet, or it can be some of these neural networks that, that are being developed now. But I guess my point here is that not the Excel spreadsheet business, but the true artificial intelligence is going to change everything. I'm not scared of it. I'm embracing it. It's going to make our lives easier. It's going to make clinical trials faster. It's going to make the whole innovation process more efficient. But I think it will change every aspect of our lives from the mundane, the, the micro all to the macro. A couple of examples. One of the companies that I helped build was a client of Janus Life Sciences Consulting, was a company called Netramark, which is an AI company. Just extraordinary technology. And they have developed an AI that is not just answering questions that we ask it, but it is actually generating hypotheses. And that is the next step in artificial intelligence. And the equally amazing thing, perhaps, is that they're doing this with small data sets. So it's not 10,000 or 100,000 patients they need. They do it with a very small data set. And that's where we're going. So the efficiency and success in some of the life sciences technologies that I'm involved in is only going to be multiplied. I'll give you another example. There's another company that has a conversational AI platform, and it measures facial features, speech, movement patterns. They've given her a name, and she extracts and detects biomarkers in the presence of disease and a treatment response even. So it is amazing. And again, I think there's this side where we sort of think of Skynet from Terminator, you know, and we're Maybe a little bit scared of this, but I don't think it's to, to, to be feared. It's it's some amazing technology that we're going to see into the future. So, and it's going to be a part of every aspect of our lives. My 25 year old went to a Halloween party as AI. He was dressed in a white t shirt and white pants. And everybody asked what he was. He says, I, I'm AI. Nobody knows what it is. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> It's very true. It's very true. Yeah. People know AI, the term, but what it exactly means is still opaque. Yeah, we're still learning. Yeah, exactly. But having been up to my uh, elbows in AI, I can tell you it's exciting and it's absolutely remarkable what's going on. And now McElwain's going to explain to us about the metaverse. Just kidding. Okay, so as we wind down the podcast, we're going to invite you to play our word association game. So just go ahead and say the first thing that comes to mind in response to each of the following phrases or words. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. Okay, here we go. Healthcare marketing. PMAC. I grew up in pharmaceuticals, so but I think for the healthcare marketing, PMAC is the first thing I think of. Bringing credibility to healthcare marketing. Life Sciences Ontario. There's all caps and there's 
lowercase, right? So Life Sciences Ontario, all caps, is an extraordinary organization fostering the life sciences ecosystem. There's the small caps, though, too. We're entering a golden age in life sciences in Ontario. This is more than one word, sorry. But that <laughs> the golden age will be my word or phrase for the small cap life sciences in Ontario. There is no wrong answer, so that's fine. You're probably not looking for a diatribe. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's from a historian. Yeah, exactly. Nonprofits. Valuable part of the ecosystem. Innovation. The solution to our problems. It's innovation. It's not cost cutting. We'll solve the world's problems and whether that's, I don't know how we're going to solve the issue of warring nations, but certainly, you know, food insecurity, healthcare, all of those will be solved by innovation, not cost cutting. And leadership. Ben Zander. Does anybody know who Ben Zander is? You're going to have to explain. Yeah, he's the uh, orchestra leader for the Boston Philharmonic. He's got the best definition of leadership, and I live by it. He was asked about his leadership and who he is and what he does as orchestra leader. He said, I am a dispenser of enthusiasm. Nothing to do with a skill set or with you know how he orchestrates. He was a dispenser of enthusiasm, and I've always lived by that. And that's not an insincere cheerleading. As a leader, you've got to be engaged and excited about what's going on. And if look, if you're not, you're probably in the in the wrong space. But enthusiasm is infectious, there's no question. And to me, it's probably the foundation of good leadership. There's a lot to say there, but I'm going to move on because it's time finally to put on your soothsayer's hat and enter our prognostication corner. So what bold predictions would you make about the life sciences industry during the coming 12, 24 months? So if you're looking for who is going to win the World Series, if you want that kind of specificity, I'm probably not going to go down a limb. But what I'll go back to the word association and the small caps, the life sciences in Ontario and, and the golden era that I believe we're now entering. So 12 to 24 months, yeah, we're going to see significant progress in the life sciences sector. There's such a strong ecosystem and all the pieces are coming together. I mentioned earlier the fact that government, I think in no small part due to COVID, realized, oh yeah, these guys actually are important. And the impact we have on the economy and the well-being of Ontarians is extraordinary. And so the government's starting to recognize that. I think the other piece is that the other parts of business are recognizing this as well. You know, there's a lot of investment going into lab space in Ontario. There's a, there's a new facility, University of Toronto. I don't know if you know, guys know anything about what's going on in, in Hamilton, the Master Innovation Park, but nodding heads so you know about that. Absolutely extraordinary vision that they have down there. Not just vision, there are, I mean, there are shovels in the ground, financing is there, what they are building is going to be amazing. In my experience, as I talk to venture capitalists, my venture capital connections are, you know, Canada is great and we need more venture capital in, in Canada, but there's tons in the States and the openness of them to come and look at opportunities and innovation here in Ontario and more broadly Canada, I think is opening up. So what I see is all the ingredients to an incredible life sciences community that rivals Boston, and San Francisco, and those sorts of areas, it's in place. And so 12 to 24 months, I'm not exactly sure what the metric is, but I'll just describe it as simply, we're entering the golden age of life sciences in Ontario. No wrong answers, but we're grading you. And I, I think, gentlemen, we agree, another Googleplex here. Is this uh, that many points? I believe so. And a strong underlying of enthusiasm. So he's walking the talk. I like that kind of exam where there's no wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Excellent. Excellent. So do I come back next week as rating champion or how does that work? We have no idea how it works. We're making it up as we go along. So can't you tell? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mark Smithies, it's been great chatting with you today during our special post-Halloween podcast. Thanks for dropping by. And thanks in particular for that Ben Zander quote. Love that. It's been an absolute pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to chat with you guys. It's been fun.
fun for us to look at your calendars, listeners. If today is November 2nd, that means the life sciences industry is about to get together in person again at the 16th Annual National Pharmaceutical Congress at the Mississauga Convention Center. You might still be able to join us. You never know. Visit www.pharmacongress.info, follow the registration link, and use promo code PODCAST to save $300 on the registration fee. Perhaps we'll see you there if you can get around all the construction on here, Ontario and Derry and the streets around Mississauga. And if you happen to be stuck at home, we will spook to you again next week. Got follow-up questions for Mark or comments for us about today's discussion? Bring them on. Just send an email to health at chronicle.org. Feel free to attach your question as a voice clip and, you never know, you might just hear yourself in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed today's NPC podcast, please like it, rate it, recommend it, and do make a point of sharing it with your colleagues. Find us at Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you choose to get your podcasts. The NPC podcast is presented in cooperation with Imprez, Canada's next generation commercial partner. Check them out at www.imprez.com. I am your announcer, Leona Void, speaking. This podcast was produced by Jeremy Visser. Research for this program came from Kylie Rebeneck and Alan Ryan. The musical theme is performed with whimsical originality by the NPC Podcast Orchestra, under the skilled direction of maestro Ross Thomas Milbrook. We'll speak again next week.